Hi everyone, this video is part one of the cognition unit. Cognition refers to thought processes, and as you can see, this video series will cover many different things that refer to the mind, so memory, thinking, and language, and intelligence. This video will specifically go over just one part of memory, the memory systems, as well as some basic memory terms. So let's start with the foundation of memory. So first, memory is just referencing uh, who we are and the information we've kept about ourselves and our lives and the world. Um, and that information that we've acquired, we would just refer to that as just persistent learning over time and keeping that information. As you can see, the diagram is meant to help us understand the different capacities we have for holding information. The first one is sensory register or sensory memory. This is information that's coming in and this capacity has a very short time frame. So some memories are coming in and it has a very, 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 very short time frame. Um, it's going into your sensory memory and you are not keeping that information. The information coming into your sensory memory lasts uh, just a second. I mean, it, it comes in, it goes out. And, um, this is just any of the information that you're bombarded with all day long, the sounds and sights and smells. You don't keep that information as long-term memories. It just kind of comes in and, and comes out. Unless you, there was some kind of meaning to that sound that occurred, um, you're probably not going to remember it. Echoic sensory memories are sound sensory memories that are coming in and going out. Uh, if you think of echo like a sound. Iconic are, are visual information that's coming in, and we're not going to keep that. If I were to you know, ask you, uh, the third person you saw today, what color was their shirt? I mean, maybe you would remember if it had some kind of meaning, but likely not. It just, it comes in and it goes out. So the second capacity is short-term memory. Short-term memory is probably not what you are imagining it to be because we often use it incorrectly in just everyday language. Short-term memory actually has a very, very, very uh, short capacity of time frame that we hold that information. Short-term memory is anything that we hold for about a minute or so. And this is the information that you can only keep if you rehearse it to yourself over and over and over. And then the moment you stop rehearsing that information and you stop thinking about it, it goes away. That is your short-term memory. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the coming slides. Long-term memory is anything that is, uh, any memory that is encoded, it's stored, and it's kept. Um, and it can be retrieved. So typically when, when we talk about our memories, we're really referring to our long-term memories. So short-term memory, as I mentioned, has a very small capacity. It's just about a minute or so, or just, I mean, that could even be too long. It's really about as long as you can rehearse that information to yourself, and then it just goes away. So I want to do a really quick short-term memory um, demo with you. So you need a piece of paper and a pencil. I'm going to read you several sets of numbers. You need to, when I say write, you'll write down the set of numbers I read to you, and then I'll read you a next set. So just try to remember, rehearse the numbers to yourself over and over and over, and then write them down when I say write. So set number one, eight, five, six, two, write. And if you need to pause, you can pause. And I'll, I might move through a little quickly. Set number two, eight, four, six, eight, three. Right. Set number three, zero, one, five, three, two, eight. Right. Set number four, eight, three, seven, six, two, three, one. Right. Set number five, eight, four, five, three, two, seven, six, five. Right. Set number six, six, four, five, three, two, six, five, seven, eight. Right. Okay, so let's check our answers. So I have the answers on the screen there and you should just go line by line and see where you made mistakes. And what I imagine is I imagine it got a little bit hard as the number set got larger and that is really normal. In fact, most people on average can only remember 
in their short-term memory, seven bits of information. That was studied by George Miller. He found out that in your short-term memory, what you can rehearse over and over and over to yourself, it really doesn't exceed seven plus or minus two chunks of information and so or bits of information and so i imagine it got very hard as you got to the last set because this exceeded seven bits of information but we do remember information that are long strings of numbers and the way we do that is we we do something called chunking so if you see this stretch of numbers right here this is a really long stretch of numbers so this exceeds that seven bits of information but we can remember this by chunking it into groups of information. So rather than the individual numbers, we can remember this in our short-term memory if we chunk it into groups. So now I see rather than all of these single digits, I see one, two, three, four groups of information and that I can hold in my short-term memory. So George Miller found out that rehearsing to ourselves over and over and over, we really only have the capacity to hold seven plus or minus two bits of information unless we chunk it and we chunk that information into groups, then we can remember more, but only about seven chunks of information. So with this new understanding of short-term memory, People often refer to this now as working memory because you have to actively process this information and consciously be aware of this information in order to keep it. And so working memory is just a newer uh, definition and understanding of the capacity of short-term memory. Next is long-term memories. Long-term memories are is just any information that you keep and you can go back and retrieve. So there are two types, explicit and implicit. Explicit memories are any memory that you have conscious awareness that you um, are making and even that you are pulling it back out. Uh, Long-term memories that are implicit are memories that you're not necessarily aware that you're making and you're really often not even aware when you're pulling it back out, you're pulling out a memory. So some examples of explicit memories are one, an episodic memory. An episodic memory is a memory of an event in your life. So if you think of it like an episode in your life, that's that would be an episodic memory, like going on vacation or remembering your first day of school. Semantic memories are memories for facts and information. So trivia, like who was the first president of the United States? That's a semantic memory. That is a memory for factual information. Then there is perspective and uh, perspective memories, which are memories for planned events. We have implicit memories, though, as I mentioned, these are memories that you're not necessarily aware that you're making or retrieving. So one of those is called a procedural memory. These are memories for how to do something. Um, we are always um, calling on these procedural memories to do all kinds of things in our life, but we're not necessarily thinking about that we are pulling out of memory or sometimes we're not even aware we've made that memory. So like brushing your teeth, you're pulling out a memory of how to brush your teeth or um, driving your car, you are pulling out all of these memories of how to do this task, uh, riding a bike, picking it up and going. You've kept that memory, but you might not necessarily be aware that you um, have kept and even are pulling that memory out as you're using it. Next, we have some foundational words about how memories are going in and being kept. And so I might use these words frequently without defining them. So you definitely want to make sure you put down a definition for these. Encoding is when memory is going in and being put down. Uh, storing is when you're keeping that information. Uh, retrieving is whenever you're going to pick it back up. So there are some other terms on the screen. Uh, effort for full processing is when you're actually trying to make that memory, like study. Um, automatic processing would be like, you're not trying to make that memory, it just is happening. Like you, uh, you probably don't try to remember the words to a song that you hear on the radio, but you realize when it's playing again that you can sing along to it and you didn't realize you made that memory. Uh, deep and shallow processing are whenever you're trying to make a memory. Um, sometimes you can do that in a productive way, like deep processing. Uh, shallow processing would not be a great way to try to make a memory. Shallow processing would be if, if you were trying to remember something and you're just trying to remember it, like if we had words and you were trying to remember a Spanish word, uh, la lechuga is lettuce, uh, and you just repeated that over and over to yourself, la lechuga, lettuce, la lechuga, lettuce. That would be shallow processing. You're not really 
assigning any meaning to that. You're just like listening to the sounds of the word and hoping to remember it after that repetition. Deep processing would be assigning some kind of meaning um, to the word la lechuga to help you remember that word. Mnemonic devices are memory tools, and I'll show you some examples of memory tools. You're probably familiar with a lot of them. Uh, mnemonic devices are memory tools that are usually using some kind of trick of, um, you know, acronyms or rhyming or um, some kind of imagery possibly to help you remember these, uh, whatever you need to remember. So these are different types of memory tools. The one on the right is um, a mnemonic device called a pegword system. People use these when they need to remember really long strings of numbers. They assign rhyming words to each number so that they can then have a rhyming type of sentence and then that helps them pull back the, the number that they need to remember. Okay, so now we're going to talk about retrieval. So retrieval is just picking up memories. Uh, there are two terms that are really similar that I want to make sure you understand in regards to retrieval. So uh, there are different ways you can retrieve memories. So let's look at the first example. You can see there's a blank and a definition. So blank is part of the brain located in the limbic system and is responsible for processing explicit memories. If you are able to just remember the term that matches that definition without any kind of prompting, then that would be recall. So if you can remember that vocabulary term, awesome. That would be recall. But if I were to give you a question like you see on the right, which part of the brain is located in the limbic system is responsible for processing explicit memories, and then I've given you a list of words to choose from, and you are able to recognize the word from the list because you've been given a set to choose from, and then you realize that's the answer because you recognize it among a set, that would be recognition. So recognition is this aspect of um, uh, the memory comes back because you've been presented with and you can pick from the, you know, from the set of which one that you are familiar with versus recall, I'm pulling out the information without any kind of prompting. Next, we have factors that influence retrieval. So a retrieval cue is anything that helps prompt a memory to come forward. So um, a retrieval cue could be all kinds of things. If you smell a scent and then it makes you think of your grandmother, then that, was a, that scent was a retrieval cue and it pulled out that memory of your grandmother. Um, some examples of situations where retrieval cues impact pulling out memories. One would be mood congruent memories. A mood congruent memory would be when you have a memory come back and you're able to retrieve a memory because you're in a similar mood state or emotional state. So maybe if you're feeling really sad and all of a sudden you're remembering other things um, that happened to you that were really sad, uh, those memories are coming back to you because you're in that same emotional state. A context-dependent memory is a memory that um, is linked with a location or a place, and so it just comes back to you or you remember it when you're back in that same location or a similar place. So an example might be if you and your friends are going to a sporting event at another school and you show up at the gym and then you look to each other and you laugh and you say, remember the last time we were here? And you you know reminisce over some something you remembered being there together. That was a context-dependent memory. You probably hadn't thought of that memory in a long time because it was tied, you know, to that location. You're probably not sitting at home thinking about that particular memory um, because it wasn't necessarily relevant. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do, we're going to go on with the same uh, theme of factors that influence retrieval. And I want you to write on your paper, spell out the word board. Okay, I hope you've spelled out the word board, and I, I want you to think to yourself, did you spell it B-O-A-R-D, or did you spell it B-O-R-E-D? If you spelled it board like you're um, not interested, you might have been primed. So priming is when something predisposes you to pull out a memory a specific way or to remember something in a certain way. And so I might have primed you by putting this picture of Alice on the screen. I predisposed you to remember the word board and spell it out in a way that you were thinking of disinterest. So another so two other terms that we need to cover, flashbulb memories. These are memories that are very, very vivid because it was tied to some very emotional event. Uh, a lot of times people have flashbulb memories over a collective emotional event. If you ask an adult um, who lived and was alive during the attack at the Twin Towers on September 11th, what were they doing? They likely have a very vivid memory because that event was very emotional and surprising and shocking. 
The self-reference effect is just that you likely have the tendency to remember things that involve you. And so memories or events that involve you, you're more likely to remember. Okay, I'm going to put this on the screen one last time for you to kind of process through the different capacities of memory. I am running out of time. I hope this was helpful for you.